Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Our interview last week was so good that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you missed last week, you'll find the link in the show notes. It's not mandatory that you listen, but we want to make sure that you don't miss out on this amazing conversation. Hi, everyone. It's Roxanne Durhodge. Thanks for tuning in again to Authentic Living with Roxanne. Today, I have a colleague, Carolyn Trevang. Trevino Jenkins. I said I wouldn't uh, trip up on the Trevino there. Um, and she is uh, someone that uh, is a Forbes Business Council, a tech, technology business council member. Um, and we were, we were fortunate enough. I, I popped into this wrong room and actually met Carolyn at that point uh, at Forbes because I'm a part of the general uh, business council. And uh, we got to know each other and She's got a fascinating story as a CEO, and I invited her today to kind of share some of the things that she's been through along her path um, that might help uh, some of us that are uh, female entrepreneurs, but also CEOs. So, Caroline, thanks so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. So, Caroline, now you and I started off because we, I think we were talking about diversity and um, you know, I was fascinated by your background because visibly I did not know um, about your background and you were sharing a couple of stories, I believe that got me intrigued. Obviously I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. So I would say visibly I'm, I'm look foreign and, and that changes that kind of sometimes the trajectory in a room, but with you um, tell us a little bit about your background and kind of, your path, I know you live in Texas at present with your family, uh, kids and your dogs and your lovely husband, but tell us a little bit about your path into kind of, you know, um, business. Well, <laughs> that's a, a big question there. So, but yeah, I think you were kind of sharing with some of the, the background and stories you and I talked about, about the way I look. Um, I am first generation American. Um, my my dad's family is from Mexico. My dad was ten when they moved here. What I look like, my mom, who's Italian. I don't look like my dad. And you know, I sort of grew up even in my childhood where I never quite fit in. There were people uh, often the Hispanic community thought I wasn't Hispanic enough. And then sometimes the the you know white community would say harsh things if they found out I was Hispanic, like literally in fifth grade, I had a teacher tell me I was the dumbest Mexican she'd ever met uh, to my face. So I, um, you know, so the, it, life's an adventure. And I, and I really learned early in life, I think that it's about how I can, how I respond to life. You know, I can't control it, but I can control how I respond to things. And that was really important to me. And that's really been important in my business career because as I, um, you know, I finished my MBA many, many, many years ago um, and, and immediately wanted to go to work and then chose not to go to work full time because I had a special needs son that was born in between my first and second year and he needed a lot from me. Um, and we had some just discrimination in the race in, in the medical system back then uh, as well before my last name was Jenkins uh, on the end of that um, and just sort of that lived experience took that into the workplace uh, again when I finally went to work full-time I worked part-time and I sort of fell into the startup world and I loved it like I had a, I was working in corporate America I was doing really well and one of my customers recruited me away to a startup in 1997 when there were not enough positions. Um, there was the Y2K scare and the internet bubble, and there were way more technology positions to, than technologists. And that's when I first jumped in the startup world. Um, and never in a million years in 1997 could I have told you I would one day be a CEO. 
So, it was so really that, that, that bandy between, um, I have to create a presence as the CEO. I want to be connected, but I need to be able to show um, authoritativeness. Like, were there things that you really had to work on for that subset of skills? Or did you find that it, it because you've been in lots of different positions with startups that that came uh, easily to you? Um, the connectivity, it was interesting. And, and when I say it's like, there were certain people in the company that we instantly had kinship and connectivity. Um, there were a couple of people, managers in the company that I'll tell you, I, I think I had their respect, but never maybe connectivity from them. Now we were a strategy execution software company. So as far as like the accountability, that was easy. Everyone had their objectives. They were all used to that. Like holding people accountable for performance was easy. Trying to have a company, um, team building event was harder than any place I'd ever been in my life. I'm like, it was so fascinating to me. Um, like once a quarter, we would go volunteer at the food bank, but we had some employees who were like, I'm not doing that. Like, I, they, and they wouldn't do it. Uh, we had, we did one quarter, we went to um, one of those puzzle rooms, you know, where you have to get the, you know, and we went to eat and we went to a puzzle room and there were employees who like leaned against the wall with their arms crossed and they're like I'm not playing this stupid game you know and it was like wow I have like never seen this kind of attitude at any of my other companies where someone's like I, I won't even try um oh and I'll tell you there were a couple of them that I never went over but they did their job as employees um they met their objectives you wouldn't say that they were bad performers but from a culture company culture standpoint like we just never connected never mm -hmm. and it felt like they never blended in it wasn't just me they never blended in to the company culture as a whole and so mm -hmm. it was hard for me it was a struggle for me to say are they the right employee then like but they're doing their job they're like doing a good job at their job they're hitting their objectives they're not a bad employee but they certainly didn't elevate the culture um they weren't maybe what you would call a culture ad. They were maybe a culture detractor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was hard. That was really hard because I was used to being, you know, um, well-liked, well-respected. Um, you know, but again, there were people I hired, which is different, I guess, you know. So right, because you're growing, you're growing the culture from the ground up if it's a startup versus like you said, when you're inheriting, uh, the context of what with prior leadership and, you know, I often say, what is the context of what's happened within the culture, the business units changes, there's so many variables. Um, and then, you know, you know, I talk about return on relationship, but ultimately if you're connected and you're doing all the things that are key to, to get people, um, you know, to function optimally, not everybody is going to want to be as cohesive. Some, some people are like, you know, just leave me in my kind of my back office. I'm going to get stuff stuff done. And I'm not the type that likes to potentially play games, you know, or do puzzles, but I'm pretty good on my own kind of thing. So it, it really depends. And it's oftentimes an individual thing as well. Yeah, it was really fascinating. Um, prior to me, the previous CEO didn't have company events. And I came out of a culture where we always had a quarterly I mean, they had company meetings, but they didn't do like fun team building activities. And of course, you can imagine my HR background. And then I was vice president of customer success. I was doing team things for my customers. And um, it's just got a core of my nature. And we always had these things at our companies in the past. And they were always a huge hit. <laughs> and I, like, I even would have, I was, I like surveyed the employees. I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And those few people were like, nothing. Like we've never had to do this before and we don't want to do it. And you're sitting there going, well, when they were hired, they didn't, they were not, it, their expectations were not set that they needed to do this. Mm -hmm. and so then how do I come in and penalize them for not wanting to do it? But it always felt awkward. Um, so, and I would like to think had I'd been there longer, I would have turned it around, but I'll never know because I was, you know, 
um, I got cancer while I was at that company. And so I didn't have the tenure there as CEO that I would have expected to have. And I would think, yeah, because the, like to your point, if you're recruiting, you're trying to find fit, these are the, the cultural norms within that, uh, that um, environment. And if, if all of a sudden it's a new thing, uh, it would take people time, right? So had you, to your point, I think it takes those kinds of shifts takes a bit of time where people are looking for consistency and, okay, why are you doing this? And, you know, uh, well, we've never had to do this <laughs> uh, since I've been here. And all of a sudden now this new CEO decides, well, we're just going to do this. Sometimes people, some people are quick on to, to adjust to change. And uh, uh, I think a lot of people aren't right. So, but that doesn't mean that so long as they're functioning, they're not disruptive, you know, they're, you're, they're, you're hitting your targets, then it becomes, well, I, you know, if we're all kind of playing nice in the sandbox, then, you know, that's what, what counts. So let's talk a little bit. You mentioned um, the cancer that you had, and let's talk a little bit about how you coped with that. Like, here you are, you're at the pinnacle, you're, you know, you're the CEO now of a company that you didn't start. And you're how old at that point, Carolyn, that this occurs that your children pretty young at that point? No, actually, um, my youngest was a junior, a sophomore, a junior in high school. Okay. So okay. My, my, my kids were, she was not yet driving, but she was, I, I said she had a permit, but she couldn't drive by herself yet. Um, okay. And I had one who was, um, well, when the, this started, I guess she was in her senior year of high school. But by the time things got really bad, like she went off to college, like I literally delayed one of my surgeries to drop her off at college um, and take her to, to school. So they were older. They were older. And then my son's way older. So. So you, you get this news. And, and then then what happens? Like. Like, what is the mindset that you go into? I mean, everybody hears that word and it's like. You know, it's that worst thing that you can hear. So how do you adapt some of the things that you already told us to, to deal with this situation? Well, you know, fortunately for me, we, we did catch, um, catch it early. And I think that's just important to share with everyone, because if I'd been a different place, I might have handled it differently. Right. This isn't a one size fits all kind of solution here, but we did catch mine early and I pretty quickly was like, OK, I'm not dying going to suck. <laughs> um, and not too long after that, my next thought was, how do I tell my board of directors? <laughs> like they mm -hmm. literally just hired me for this job. Like I'm not that far into my job. And how do I go tell a room full of men that I, I have breast cancer, which was very uncomfortable. Like this is where my brain was spinning. I hadn't even left the doctor's office yet. And I'm sitting there going, well, wait a minute. You know, like when you say someone like, oh, I, I broke my foot. Everyone looks at your foot or, you know, like someone's like, you, you know, well, what should you do your wrist? Or, you know, it's just human behavior. When mm -hmm. someone tells you they broke something, you tend to look at it because you just intuitively want more details. And so I'm going, okay, great. I'm going to walk into this room full of men and I'm going to say, I have breast cancer. Like, what does one wear for this? Like, I know this sounds so ridiculous, but this literally crossed my mind. I'm like, is this like, do I wear a shawl to work that day? Do I just wear a blazer? Like, and then I'm like, and when do I tell them? And literally this was one of the things where it's like, who's going to like help me figure out when do I tell my board? They, they, they just hired me and now I'm, I've got cancer. Um, and I couldn't find anyone to share that advice, but kind of goes back to all those other lessons. I mean, any other problem, I wouldn't tell the board there was a problem until I had a potential solution for the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to just call them and say, oh my God, we just lost our biggest client. You might call and, you know, oh, we lost our biggest client. Give me 24 hours. Like I'm internally, like, what am I going to do to handle it? Let me have a plan. Now I need to tell the board, you know? Um, so I decided not to tell them anything until I had a plan. Like, how am I going to handle the fact that I have cancer? But I knew I had to tell them sooner rather than later, because we, again, we all worked in office. It was in 2018. And like, 
people are going to notice our brand new CEO sure is missing a lot. Like, where is she? Because I had all these appointments and then I was going to start having surgery. And I'm like, you can't hide that. But I needed a plan. Uh, so I decided to wait until I had my plan. And I was very fortunate um, that I had a very, very supportive board. Um, but everything that you learn in being a leader also just became this on a cancer journey, like advocating for yourself. It's like advocating for your career. Don't expect someone else to do it for you. Um, look for mentors, like look for, so for someone else who's had cancer and find that person to help you, even if it's just to listen or to make suggestions. Um, the best advice I got came from strangers. I, maybe I shouldn't say the best, but a lot of good advice came from strangers who had walked the walk. And, and sometimes that's how we get our business advice, right? We, we meet people who we think, you know, we look at their backgrounds and we're like, they've lived my experience. So let me listen to them and see what I might discern that would help me on my journey. And that helped in cancer. This is just no differently than how you might manage your career. Mm. Like, don't let it just unfold and happen to me. I want to drive the process. So you just kind of sat with it and really reflected, like you said, for like to your point, we've just gone to a, we've gone to a renewal meeting and something has gone awry. And, you know, oftentimes in those scenarios, you're trying to process and you, so you kind of took the same approach and then eventually kind of went back to them and was able to deliver. Now, the fascinating thing is, and this is the new startup that you're a part of, right? And, and it's called, um, we are here. We are here. We are here. I was just trying to look at my notes. We are here. So I, I love, I love this story because it's so, you know, it just speaks to the, the depth of, how you're able to go into a scenario and glean out these amazing things. So tell everyone about the startup and what's involved with it and how, how it uh, started. The whole um, incubation of this, the startup was through the cancer process for you. It really was. Like I said, that's that same visit where I was, you know, told I had cancer. Um, I got handed a binder. It's a, you know, thick binder. <laughs> And, you're, and I'm looking at this binder and, you know, again, someone who's been in technology for many, many years going, what am I supposed to do with this paper binder? Um, and I know that it's well-intentioned. Um, the, you know, the medical professionals and their clinicians, their number one objective is to save your life. And mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly support that. But unfortunately, what that often means is that some of these other things don't get as well addressed. So this binder has like pages and pages and pages of URLs. They would just have like a name and a URLs. And here's some resources for you to go type and look in yourself. And then, but some of them had nothing to do with breast cancer. And some of them had nothing to do with my breast cancer because there's lots of different types of breast cancer. And then if you think just about, and I had options for how I got treated. So then there's all these things that have nothing to do with my treatment choices. And so it's, it became a time waste for me. And I just, I put the binder aside and I just never went and looked at it again. I'm like, I got this great binder that I don't even use because it, it meant nothing. It was a use. And then some of the best resources were nowhere in the binder. And it was just too hard. It was, well, it was harder than it needed to be. The non-medical side was so much harder than it needed to be. So my first inkling of someone needs to do something was the binder. And I'm like, this should not be that hard. But right before I had a bilateral mastectomy, the nurse was explaining I was going to have these four post-surgical drains. And she's like, when you're, when you're allowed to shower, you're going to put the drains on a safety pin, put those on a wire coat hanger, and then hang that on the shower head. And I'm like, okay, you just told me I'm not allowed to put raise either hand over my shoulders. So how am I supposed to get on the shower head? And she's like, oh, just get your husband to do it. And this was a big turning point for me. Cause I'm like, first off, what if I didn't have a husband? Now I do, but I have a husband. He's not always home. He sometimes travels for work. Um, his job is not a flexible job because he works in hazardous materials. He can't take an hour or two off. He takes the whole day off or no day off, you know? And so I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking like how to, what? and I'm really independent. And you just said, I can't shower 
for eight weeks unless someone's home with me. That didn't work for me. But you're also assuming day one that with this like new sort of, you know, um, really my body with scars and pieces missing and drains with not attractive things in them that I'm just going to be like, oh, honey, just come on in the shower and help me. Like, no, like I don't, I don't like to think I'm vain, but I care. And I'm like, I don't know that's the image I want burned in my husband's uh, brain and he would be loving and supporting. It's just, I'm not sure, like you can't unsee that. And mm -hmm. I don't, I'm like, I don't know from day one, I'm going to be ready for that. Like, but that's what you're assuming. And the answer was a $12 shower belt that it took me two hours to find. And then that was really sort of the turning point of when I'm done, somebody needs to make this easier. Like there are great resources out there. There's products out there, there's services, there's over 5,000 cancer nonprofits. It is overwhelming and exhausting and too hard to get connected to exactly what you need when you need it. But technology is so right for doing this. So, so here's that problem solver again in you, right? Like thinking, you know, that's a, that's a fascinating story. Like exactly like, you know, if to your point, psychologically, emotionally, as women, we're going to think about our breasts. Like, I mean, and then you're thinking, right. Like, do I, I have to get accustomed to what I feel like about my body. And then, you know, like to your point, you know, who do you want in that space? Maybe you're just getting accustomed. So, you know, they're just the elements. So being able to come up this beautiful binder clearly had a lot of things, but the technological parts of what you, you developed, people can access online. Is that about the experience and, and the support? And it is, you know, um, every, each one of us as a human is very complex. Like mm -hmm. you and I, um, we have probably different family situations. Um, you know, if you look at our economics, our location, our family, you know, all the different things that go into what you need for cancer. Like how many people do you have to give you rides? How many people like, are you going to have your meals? You know, like, do you have kids that need to go to camp? Or, like your personal life is very complex. Your cancer journey is very complex. Like mm -hmm. you can have two people with the exact same cancer diagnosis, same stage, but maybe they chose different treatment paths. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs something so different and they need it at a different time. But with technology, we can match all those complicated characteristics of an individual and their demographics, their social support, their economic support and their lifestyle, what's going on in their life. And we can match that to all the resources so that we only are serving up what they need when they need it. And we educate them about things they don't even know to ask for. I, I have learned so many things I could have done had it just, but you don't know what you don't know. So with a solution like ours, we can gently nudge people. Would you be interested in, for example, the divorce rate for cancer is higher than the national average. Wow. Out of all the many doctors I had and nurses, not one said, by the way, be mindful of your marriage or be mindful of your relationship. Mm -hmm. Nobody said that, you know, but we can gently nudge people. We can share with them. Here's a statistic. We're not saying it, you know, we're not trying to tell people you must go get into marriage counseling, but we want to just make you aware mm -hmm. of this and why. I mean, you think about why. I mean, the financial distress, the intimacy distress, all the things that if it's not cancer still impact marriages and you're taking them all on at once, right? No wonder it's so high. Um, you're not often told a lot. We're getting better in this country, but you may not be told that there's an option for saving your hair because it's hard on the clinicians and on the infusion rooms. If you decide to cold cap, it makes it more difficult for them. Um, the technology is getting better. The infusion centers are getting more receptive, but like none of my doctors even threw that out there as an option. You know, mm -hmm. and one of my co-founders, they didn't tell her either, but her mom found it. And so she cold capped, you know, so we just want to make sure we're educating people, empowering people by giving them what they need when they need it, instead of overwhelming them with a the big thick binder that doesn't even have everything in it because clinicians don't have the time to put everything in it. And then they're not going to invest in technology 
on this, they're investing in the technology related to your chemo, your radiation, you know, where they should be investing their, their dollars. What a, what a fascinating experience, right? Like, I mean, out of something so adverse um, came out something where you can give people um, some kind of, like if you're reeling in your marriage, right? Like maybe your partner's still numb and you're numb, kind of how to have those, you know, those conversations, or like you said, how do I talk to the people on my board? Or how is it that I deliver this to my children? Or, you know what I mean? What nutrition, there's so many uh, different things that it sounds like. So is it that when people come in, they're triaged based on what their needs are with their diagnosis? Like you said, everybody, each one of us is so individual. So their interaction with you is quite unique depending on, on the case. It absolutely is. And so we have over 30 broad categories, but each category has a lot of sub, you know, um, uh, categories in it, if you will. But someone, you know, it might be that they need financial assistance. It might be that they need mental health counseling, and it might be that they need product recommendations. I mean, they get to sort of share with us what they see as their top three in the and we help throughout the whole journey and beyond, but we start with what are your top three? Because again, we don't want to overwhelm them. So mm -hmm. it's like, let's just start knocking down things sort of systematically. But if I um, give you the equivalent, the electronic equivalent of a binder, if I give you an email and, and, and you know, many, many places do this, they, they'll send you an email, well-intentioned email, but it has like 20 links in it. Here's some resources for you. It's a little better because you didn't have to type them in, but you still have to go click on them, read them. Like it's only, it's not that much better than the paper notebook. And we won't do that to people. It's what do you really need right this minute based on where you are? Let's take care of that. And we just stay in constant communication. So as their journey evolves, um, we're still there with them. And we help caregivers, we help survivors. The very first person that we helped in 2022, January 2022, um, is still using us for resources today. Wow, amazing, amazing. So Caroline, I know we're almost at time, but I'm curious, what is one of the biggest things that you learned going through something like this? I don't know if, um, did I learn it or if I reaffirmed it? I, I have had a couple of opportunities in my life um, where there were extraordinary circumstances, if you will. Like my, my son was born with special needs and almost died many times as an infant. And then he was in a critical horseback riding accident when he was 17 and almost died then. So I think I maybe had multiple times to get ready for the emergency being myself, but it was that affirmation that your personal attitude is a significant portion of the journey and how your body responds like your ability to find the positive your ability to find the joy in the daily in the small it doesn't mean a bunch of it doesn't stink or suck but your day your ability to focus on the positive every day um, makes a huge, huge difference in your experience during the journey itself, but also in your outcomes. Whether you're diverse, whether you're a female executive, whether you're a CEO, or whether you're someone going through um, things. And I often say to have lived as long, most of us have been through something, right? And it's that bounce back about, okay, now I'm down. Okay, how long am I going to be down? And what is it that I need to kind of pick up accept to your point, and then kind of go from there. So for Carolyn, for anybody that might want to know more about um, your company, or just even, you know, follow you to because I mean, I will, I will say that um, I'm always love to meet women like you that are out there in the world sharing such amazing richness. Um, and for younger women still coming up, you know, sometimes it, it gets debilitating to think, oh, there's so many things I have to climb over in order to get um, where I need to. I think inspirations like yours and other women like you are, are good to um, connect with. So wh where was it that people can get a hold of you or, um, you know, get connected with, with your company? Well, if you want to get a hold of me, my LinkedIn profile 
um, and it is my name, Carolyn Cervino Jenkins, um, on LinkedIn, and or just go to wearehere.com, which is much easier to spell. So. <laughs> Well, I thank you again for spending the time with uh, my audience. What am I, what am I taking away? I'm taking away that it's all, you know, in how we deal with perspective, right? Like whether it's you wanting to um, look at your long-term aspirations, whether it's something within your family, whether it's an illness or whether it's something that you just want to achieve, what is your legacy imprint? Think about that and think, there's going to be trip ups along the way. And I know I've had my fair share of, the, of them. And clearly you've had a lot of things happen, but don't let that define who you are, because it is not you. We all will go through things in life. Right. So I am in launch week for my new book. Um, so oh, it's, it's launching on uh, the 10th of June. So uh, for anybody wanting to know more about a uh, return on relationships and authentic leadership, working with resilient teams, um, you know, please uh, go to roxanderhodge.com forward slash book and you can uh, pre-order a copy. And again, uh, Carolyn, thanks so much for spending the time and for everyone listening. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you take the time every single week to hang out with me. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.